I'm Matt. I'm Shane. And if you like what you hear, make sure you hit that thumbs up button real hard and make sure you subscribe to Comic Movie Marks. And also click that little bell for all of the notifications. Whee! Always remember, if Trailer Trash can do it, anyone can do it. Hello and welcome everyone to another Comic Movie Marks video. For the first time in Comic Movie Marks history, we may agree with the critics. We have no idea what they've said, but we might <laughs> we might agree with them in some sense. I don't know. I don't think we really agree with them at all. I didn't read a single review, uh, just some stuff on social media, I guess, but nothing from, from critics. But I don't know. You look at the 39% Rotten Tomatoes gave it today. Not that that means anything. 6.9 out of 10 on IMDb. I, I guess we'll get into it. If you have seen our non-spoiler review, or even if you haven't, it's entertaining so you should go check it out. But hopefully this kind of helps shine some light on where our head is at. Specifically, Matt, he went on a fantastic rant, which uh, I found very entertaining, as did <laughs> some people in our comment section. <laughs> and they even disagreed with me, but they still thought it was funny. Yeah, exactly. That's how you get them. We will start off with the positives, or I should say I will start off with the positives. I brought up a lot of this in the non-spoiler review. The beauty of this movie is... Cannot be denied. I mean, regardless of everything else that we're going to get into, it was a beautiful movie. The action was pretty solid. The monsters that you got to see fight each other was pretty badass. And I don't think there was a whole lot of flaws in the CGI. I, th I thought that, that was pretty cool. I actually also enjoyed the score. And a lot of aspects, maybe it wasn't the most mind-blowing thing, but at a lot of points, it fit. And it kind of you know it builds you up a lot, especially when it comes to the action and the fighting with the monsters. Yeah, there was actually something that I thought was kind of cool is how they displayed, especially King Ghidorah. They actually gave King Ghidorah, you know, Ghidorah must pose. And he had a lot of <laughs> posing opportunities. They gave him a lot of, he would uh, flex, I guess would be the word. It looked beautiful on screen. Great backdrop, great look. And I thought that was very well executed. The other monsters looked great. I thought Rodan looked fantastic. I love the effects they had when he flew and he just wrecked the shit out of the city. It looked really great. He kind of bitched out eventually. Mothra, though, they obviously put a lot of creative juices in how she looked in the movie. Fantastic visuals. We saw some of that in the trailer, but the wings, the everything, how she was presented in that, I thought was phenomenal. It looked great. Yeah, that shot from the trailers of Mothra just opening up in the waterfall. It does not do it justice on like a small screen like your phone. When you actually see it in the theater, it was fucking fantastic. That part was was awesome. All right. Negatives. Uh, <laughs> How much time you got? I'm not going to rant too much about this because I think it just really comes down to this. This is a very, very badly written movie. They've had five years to write this movie, to figure out what the sequel to the Godzilla 2014 is. I've seen several people in the non-spoiler comments and other things like that. It's, you know, it's monster versus monster. That's all you should care about. Bad writing is what Godzilla movies are about. What? There's a difference between bad writing and what a fundamental look of a movie is. There's monsters versus monsters, but there's a reason why, like, Pacific Rim 2, for instance, didn't do as well as the first one, because they overcomplicated the story. They made ridiculous characters. They had stupid twists and tried to swerve you on pointless things. That's the thing of bad writing. Same thing with Jurassic Park Fallen Kingdom. Another instance where dinosaurs on the mainland should be interesting in some sense, but no, they add... Stupid twist. There's a girl that's cloned, and because she's considered a living being, so are the dinosaurs. So she makes a stupid asinine decision, frees all the dinosaurs right out into the mainland of the states. So now we have T-Rexes roaring at lions. Fantastic shit, right? A premise that is just so stupid, where we acknowledge there's terrible writing, even in these movies where it's just monster versus monster, or it's robot versus monster, or it's just big fucking dinosaurs. We should just enjoy them. This script is so lazy, and you cannot tell me for three seconds that this was not a committee script. This was a bunch of ideas thrown in a pot, stirred together, and put out on a screen. Formulated into a lazy screenplay with cliche after cliche after cliche. This movie, it was dumbed down to a astronomical level. But that movie you just talked about is only being made for the global right. audience. And you see it like all over the place. I mean, I saw the Mamma Mia sequel, Here We Go Again, and I couldn't believe 
how much attention had been paid to the global needs of the box office in terms of a kind of bland, inoffensive cleanliness uh, in terms, of, and also a kind of borderline dumbness of where anybody in any language can understand exactly what's going on in every scene because of the you know, facial expressions of the characters. And I'm sure, I mean, since 70% of the global audience is not going to be seeing this movie in its, in their language, that's kind of what the demands right. are. Yeah, I think that's the biggest flaw in this movie that I, I do agree with is the overcomplication of the script. And that part was, I think, was very surprising. When you look at, you compare it to Godzilla 2014, they had a relatively basic script, and they threw in some details here and there that you can care or not care about. But for the most part, it was basic. And I think largely that's what you come to hope and expect from a movie like this is, yeah, we we just wanted it to be the monster versus monster, some action, some basic underlining script and plot that keeps the movie going. But for the most part, don't over overcomplicate things. And then you get into the relationships and so much. And that's just the foundation. Then there are several other levels, as Matt said, that are came across on the screen as just ideas thrown out the wall of like, let's throw this in there. Let's throw this in there. Let's throw Godzilla flatlining or or whatever. Someone's going to swim to the journey to the center of the earth for fuck's sake. They threw in so much that it just kind of made the movie eye rolling and not in a good way. And there there was plenty of this movie that, that I laughed at that I enjoyed where I'm like, wow, I can't believe they went there. And I wasn't as frustrated as Matt was, but I was still surprised that this was the direction they decided to go. As Matt put it, you have five years to come up with a script to figure out what the sequel is to try to build this monster universe. And that's what you deliver. You clearly established a narrative in the 2014 Godzilla. There's a narrative. It's not so much about the repercussions of nuclear war like the original Japanese Godzilla is. This is more of he's been around forever. He's a god almost. He's essentially a titan that has been ruling the land for eons. That's the type of narrative you set up. That's what the Ken Watanabe character is about. He even kind of states that a little bit in the beginning of this, that he they think they're almost kind of deity or omnipotent beings, almost. And you should have just stuck with that narrative. There's no reason to add eco-terrorists. All of a sudden, now, some woman gets this idea that overpopulation, Thanos did it, and now we have other resource problems, pollution. Out of nowhere, this becomes an issue in this universe when it was never stated before. It was nothing was ever said in the previous movies that all of a sudden there was some kind of issues that we needed to reduce population, that we needed to formulate this overcomplicated plan to reduce population and bring back nature to the way it was. It's just a random idea that was thrown against the wall to move the plot along. It's very simple. You eliminate the family. And I know they had a family in the first one, but they really didn't matter. It was all kind of focused around the Aaron Taylor Johnson character, which, by the way, I love the 2014 movie. And that thing was led by a plank of wood. He is a plank of fucking wood. If, if him and Brie Larson were in a movie, I mean, it would be a battle of wood. hey -oh. Eliminate the family completely. I don't need Millie Bobby Brown's character at all. I don't need the two other individuals, the dad and the mother, Kyle Chandler, Vera Fermanga, whatever her name is. I don't need either one of those characters. I don't need the child. They only used Millie Bobby Brown in this just because she was a recognizable face. It was all about the marketing. It was the same thing they did with the 2014 one mm -hmm. with Brian Cranston. They used his face a lot in the marketing, ended up killing him and pissing off a lot of people. Well, this time they use her face as the marketing, keep her throughout the movie, but she's a completely irrelevant character. The military is being talked about how they want to destroy these monsters from the start. All you got to do is simplify it like this. The military goes in, tries to destroy Monster Zero beforehand. They either botch it, or if you really want the eco-terrorists in there, they sabotage it. Releases King Ghidorah, he releases the other monsters, we get monster porn. 
End of story. We don't need a stupid c computer that fucking somehow sends some shitty signal out, some kind of wavelength orca signal motherfucking thing that makes no goddamn sense. You don't have a bunch of eco-terrorists fighting for the destruction of the world, but they want to survive because they're so fucking important. But then they don't like how the end of the world's going to come about because before it was going to be one at a time. So that's going to everybody just get in line one at a time and die properly. We can't have the whole fucking thing just start whacking everybody out of existence. <laughs> and so it's very simple. Eliminate them. Eliminate her and her ridiculous reasons. Just make it again like it was in the 2014 version. Alpha. Who is going to be the winner? Woo! You got to beat the man to be the man. And that's what you do. You have Godzilla versus King Ghidorah. You can have Mothra versus Rodan. You can have all these side monsters as well. But that's what you got to do. The championship fight. Right? But no, you overcomplicate it. You bring in terrible characters that don't make any sense. And the cliches, the cliches, Shane brought this up in the earlier in the review here, but the, the heartbeat, all of a sudden they're using like sonar waves and they're able to detect Godzilla's heartbeat and they're isolating it. And all of a sudden I'm watching an episode of ER or Grey's Anatomy and it's going beep, beep, beep. He's dead. What? <laughs> How stupid do you believe your audience is? I mean, that's what I mean. Some of it is just insulting. And then it turns out the motherfucker ain't even dead. He's in some kind of fucking healing coma like he's Superman or some shit. He apparently swims away a great distance, as they show. <laughs> a great amount of distance. And lays dormant inside of a radioactive underwater city or center of the earth thing, as Shane was describing. Something that's so heavy in radiation and heat, the drones can't even make it all the way to Godzilla. But Ken Wananabe's character, his little boat just parks right up on the thing. He walks right on out, like nothing even fucking is happening. He walks over to Godzilla, pets him a little bit before he the bomb blows. They killed off one of the best characters, Ken Wabanabe's characters, for no fucking reason. It was the most pointless sacrifice. I don't understand why you would do that. The other, the British woman that was in there, she just dies. And the only way you even know she's dead is because he's looking at a folder later on and it shows her picture and it says deceased. That's what's insulting about it. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with keeping a movie simple. And if it would have been a very simple plot and it would have been criticized, I think our reaction for one would have been the opposite like hey this movie is meant to be this way like matt and i we went and saw baywatch it got shit all over and we laughed our asses off and said you're overthinking this this was a simple plot it was supposed to be over the top i'm sure hobbs and shaw is not going to be the most deep and emotional movie that i've ever seen in my entire life there's certain movies you just want it to be a basic plot stop bad guy number one or whatever or the idea that matt had with this movie have something where king Ghidorah ends up coming out and then summoning the rest of the monsters and godzilla has to fight him that's it you don't need much else obviously the plot has to move along you have to have some characters in there but they should not be the focus on it I think where a lot of people may have enjoyed this movie that where Matt and I may have struggled is being able to just ig ignore the underlining plot and the story and just enjoying the monsters themselves, which w were awesome. But at the end of the day, the plot, eh, it's a little frustrating. And I, I'd be surprised to see where this whole universe goes. I know they are trying to build to eventually... Uh, king kong versus godzilla or king kong and godzilla versus other people they you know tag team but i'd be surprised now after this type of reception and seeing how everything's going I'd be surprised to see where the universe ends up the issue with the script is the cliches as well and look at movie cliches i don't know if shane and i have just seen a lot of movies but you see it reused over and over again in this movie how many times were there like you have this amount of time before this bomb blows up or this amount of time before godzilla blows up or you have this amount of time our windows closing before we can hack this thing it's just rushing the plot along 
It's it's literally like the the editors for this movie saying, well, chop, chop, chop. We got to get this going. Move, move, move. Go, go, go. And it's just constantly the same cliche reused over and over again. The ending of this movie is just so asinine. One, the Millie Bobby Brown character starts dodging Ghidorah's lasers. Like, what the fuck is that? Like, it is three heads just blasting the shit out of this building. And she's just briskly jogging through it all, dodging the rubble, no problem. Ghidorah steps on the computer, but yet it's dented. And they can fix it with, like, a fucking screwdriver. They actually make that thing work again. For what, though? Just to distract Ghidorah for, what, seconds? And then all of a sudden now, the mom, she's the hero. She wants her redemption story. So poorly written. She wants her redemption story. Uh, she might as well be Vader with that kind of fucking storytelling ability. Jesus, it's just so, it's so cliche. She's driving the Hummer, dodging rubble. Oh, what? Millie Bobby Brown's character, she just hides in that home after one of the most asinine fucking reasons ever. Oh, if I was your kid, I'd run away from home. Uh. What'd you say? Home. Oh, she's at home. Oh, of course. Why did we fucking think of that genius writing from the start? If I can feel like I can write a better script with my retarded ass, then you got a problem. These people are paid millions of dollars to write a screenplay, and they can't even fucking formulate reasonable dialogue throughout the movie. And Millie Bobby Brown being in the building, and it falls, but she just happens to make it in the tub, but one hand's hanging out, so you can see that she survived, or where she's at. Because they wouldn't have been able to find her if her hand was hanging out. Wasn't hanging out. It's just so cliche. It's so over the top, and it's just insulting. It was done by committee. This is exactly what happened with Justice League. This is what exactly happened to The Predator. This is what happens when studios overdevelop a movie. And I think we all got to be consistent on this. If you see a movie like this that has terrible writing and it's overdeveloped and it's obviously done by committee, you got to point that shit out. Yes, the monsters fighting is a spectacle and for the most part is very awesome. But there's a borderline thing here. I, I go to watch John Wick movies to watch a 50 year old man beat up on people. But the story at the same time is simple. They're not trying to overdo it. They don't try to make it like all of a sudden there's going to be a nuke that's going to blow up the building if John Wick doesn't beat the shit out of this one dude. No, it's John Wick needs to survive. Just keep it simple. One of the other things that I've noticed coming out of this is, again, because critics are so inconsistent. I haven't really checked any critic scores or any critic reviews for this movie because this was my most anticipated movie of the year. I really didn't give a shit. We actually have a thing on our Twitter where I was making fun of some of the critic reaction before I saw the movie because I'm like, you guys are assholes. There's no way. Godzilla King of the Monsters is going to be a great fucking movie. And it's, it's up there, but I hate the fucking movie. 90% of the time, I have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. I think their credibility has just gone to the wayside. More and more, people just don't believe them. And this could be a good thing at the same time, but when you have such inconsistencies, uh, one guy put for Endgame, the most confusing and convoluted of any of the Marvel Cinematic Universe films, yet it's also unbelievably satisfying. He gave it 8 out of 10 for Endgame. For... For Godzilla King of the Monsters, a movie with a convoluted plot that makes no sense, having no plot would have been much better. Kind of reiterating almost the same idea for both movies, and he gave that one a 2 out of 10. See, this is what happens when you start sucking the mouse's dick. If you can't be consistent, you start looking like a dumbass. And if you're a dumbass, no one's going to listen to you. And I'm probably going to get something in the comments saying, well, we're not listening to you. And now, so we're at this point where critic and critiques in themselves are pretty much morally bankrupt for the most part. Maybe some people listen to it because of what happened with the box office, or maybe there's just summer movie fatigue. Because as Shane and I are finding out, it seems like every fucking week there's some kind of movie. I'm already, I'm still like three movies behind that I want to see. And we've been, re we've been out reviewing more movies, I think, this last month than we did all last year. <laughs> so it just kind of is overwhelming. And I just wonder if people are just running out of money, running out of time to keep doing this shit every single week. And maybe that's also what's affecting Godzilla as well. Maybe it's just a mixture of all of it. 
The movie is supposed to be monster versus monster. I completely understand that. But there still needs to be some kind of structure. And when you have insulting dialogue, insulting plot, things that just don't make any sense and just overdeveloped and obviously done by committee. This is no one person's true vision. This is a committee's vision. This is what they thought was best for business. That's when you start running into creativity is dead and mediocrity is winning. No matter how much we enjoy the monster versus monster action, we still need to make a stand when there's shitty writing like this. And telling stories is always going to be what drives any form of entertainment. I don't care if it's wrestling, movies, music, books, television commercials, selling Viagra. It doesn't fucking matter. You've got to have a great story. Damn. <laughs> All right, so I guess uh, on to our scores now. Um, kind of said really all that needs to be said. Fantastic visuals. Entertaining if you can ignore the horrible plot, the annoying dialogue, but just enjoy the action, the beauty of it. For me, I gave it a 2.3 out of 5 marks. As I said earlier, this is my most anticipated movie of the year. And that could be the reason why I'm so disappointed with it is it's something I was really looking forward to. I wanted to see this movie more than any other movie this year. It's disappointing to see how poorly done it was and how half-assed the writers and the, just the studio in general, how little effort they put into the movie. They just hoped that Monster vs. Monster would sell and people would just shut off their brains and completely ignore any kind of dialogue or anything like that. And they phoned it in. They phoned it in for the most part. Hopefully Godzilla vs. King Kong or whatever they do next would be much better. But this one, I'm going to have to give 1.5 out of 5 marks. <laughs> in case I don't see you. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Congratulations, you made it to the end of the video. You're one of very few <laughs> to make it to the end. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to Comic Movie Marks Podcast and hit the notification bell. You know, all these fucking YouTube channels say this shit, so I'm going to say it now. Yes, it's perfect. And if you want to hear our full podcast, you can check out our podcast on iTunes or any other podcast subscription service. Make sure you subscribe. Thanks again. Yo!